Halos are a cross-cultural recognized symbol of spiritual advancement and ethical purity. Do you call it enlightenment? Well, in what scale? Right, right. I think it's probably better to have one than not. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest fashion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. We are living in some wild ass times right now, folks, and you don't need me to inform you of that, but you might need me to help you alleviate some of the stress in your life as we observe and participate in this crazy world. According to the American Psychological Association, chronic stress is linked to the six leading causes of death. Stress has been implicated in things like heart issues, inflammation, obesity, and even mental illness. And when most people think of stress, they think of their job, traffic, tense relationships, pandemics, fake or real. And they focus on the solutions like meditation, going to the spa, getting a massage and so on. But what if the root of so much of the stress we experience comes down to a deficiency in one overlooked nutrient? Well, that nutrient is magnesium. Magnesium is the body's master mineral. It controls over 300 critical reactions, including detoxification, fat metabolism, energy, and of course, stress. Even your digestion is influenced by the presence of magnesium. So if there's one mineral you want to get into your diet, it's magnesium. That's why I'm here to tell you about one of my favorite products on the market called Magnesium Breakthrough. In fact, I'm recording this plug from the Joe Dispenza retreat in uh, Marco Island, Florida. And I only brought about three or four different supplements with me in my case. And one of them is always magnesium breakthrough. So if you are ready to fortify your body with some really great magnesium right now, you can simply go to buyoptimizers.com slash Luke. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S, buyoptimizers.com Luke. And if you use the code LUKE10, you'll save yourself 10% off, but you can also save yourself up to 40% off select packages of Magnesium Breakthrough. So it's a crazy value. You can only find this value at buyoptimizers.com slash Luke. You're not going to find it on their regular site or on Amazon. So we've got a hookup for you again. It's LUKE10 at buyoptimizers.com slash Luke. If you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, you should know that it would not be possible without support from our friends over at Beekeepers Naturals. Now, when I sat down to cut this run of 2021 ads, I thought, which one do I want to start with? And it immediately came to mind that I use the Propolis Throat Spray more often than any of their other amazing products, as delicious and useful as they are. I always travel with the throat spray. I use it on airplanes, anywhere I'm going to be around other people's funk, when the air is dirty and germy. And I also keep it by my bedside to use first thing in the morning when I wake up, especially in dry climates where I get a little bit of sore throat or if I'm just feeling like a twinge of a cold or something like that possibly coming on. The Propolis Throat Spray is not only a powerful natural medicine, but it also tastes delicious. It's kind of like a mild honey flavor. In fact, it's so delicious that my fiance, Allison, saw me using this stuff so often that eventually she jacked a bottle of it for herself because there's a few around the house. She's free to do so, of course. And now she's on board with it and she travels with it as well. So it is a family favorite. These little bee creatures make some incredible stuff and bee propolis is one of my favorites. It delivers natural germ-fighting properties and antioxidants to help protect our bodies. It's also sustainably sourced and this spray is made with just three simple ingredients. So you're never going to find any refined sugars, dyes, dirty chemical, none of that swag ever. So if you're ready to check out the Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray, here's what you do. Go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash lukestory. That's beekeepersnaturals.com slash Luke Story. The spelling is B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S. Beekeepersnaturals.com slash Luke Story. And if you use that link, which of course is also easily clickable in the show notes for this episode, you're going to save yourself 15% off. 
Despite the insanity we see in the world, this present moment in 2021, my friends, I am deeply grateful for the opportunity to interview today's guest, Dr. Jim Hart. This is episode 325. It's called BioCybernaut, the Science of Spirituality. It was recorded on location at the BioCybernaut Institute in lovely Sedona, Arizona. Here's a little bit about our incredible guest. And when I say incredible, I'm not using the term lightly. Dr. Hart is just a fascinating human being. And when I say fascinating, I mean to the nth degree. And his credentials are equally impressive. Here's a little bit about our guest, Jim. Dr. James V. Hart has dedicated his entire life in the research and development surrounding brainwave training. Dr. Hart has earned a national reputation as a preeminent research scientist for his over 40 years of work in biofeedback. So for the past 40 years, Jim's been studying the electrophysiological basis of advanced spiritual states. He's traveled to India several times to study advanced yogis with his technology. He studied Zen meditators and Zen masters and explored Christian prayer and contemplation. Dr. Hart's secret sauce and what he's really known for is developing a technology based on EEG measurement and feedback combined in a highly optimized methodology with computerized measures of subjective states, in-depth interviews, and extensive coaching in forgiveness, engaged indifference, and non-attachment. These technology and training methodologies have demonstrated significant effectiveness in healing and transforming core dimensions of personality dysfunction, reducing stress and anxiety, reversing key aspects of the brain's aging process, increasing creativity by 50% and boosting IQ by nearly 12 points on average, enhancing peak performance, facilitating conflict resolution and expanding spiritual awareness while increasing access to advanced spiritual states. This stuff is no joke. And what you're going to learn in this interview, uh, in addition to just James, you know, extensive body of work is uh, my experience at BioCybernaut in 2015. So we really go off the deep end here on the science of spirituality. Uh, Dr. Hart also serves as the president and founder of BioCybernaut Institute. Dr. Hart holds a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Carnegie Institute of Technology, a master's degree in psychology from Carnegie Mellon University, and a PhD in psychology from Carnegie Mellon University. And he's done postdoctoral work in psychophysiology at the Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute of the University of California at San Francisco. I said all that to say Jim knows his stuff and you are in for a huge treat on this episode. Speaking of episodes, we'll be back next week with number 326. Uh, and I got to say next week's episode is one of those ones I'm, I'm really having second thoughts about putting out because <laughs> it was so deeply personal and just so intense. That episode is called 5-MEO DMT Integration Session, Ufo Alvarius Toad Medicine with Aubrey Marcus. That's next week. You definitely want to tune in for that, even though I kind of don't want you to. Uh, essentially, Aubrey and I sat down and unpacked uh, a ceremony that we shared recently in Austin, Texas, my future home. So that's next week. But this week, it's all about Jim and BioCybernaut and this episode recorded in Sedona, Arizona. I'm kind of on tour right now, recording all over the place. In fact, I'm sitting right here after my second day at this Joe Dispenza retreat in uh, Marco Island, Florida. So the Lifestylist podcast is on the move, folks. Okay, so get ready to introduce your mind to your heart as we set out to merge the world of spirituality and science with Dr. Jim Hart. Enjoy the show, and by all means, if you dig this conversation like I did, share it with a friend. Here we are, Dr. Hart. Good to see you again. Wonderful to be with you. Oh, yes. man. For those listening, I, mm -hmm. I feel so bad. You guys just missed a really uh, fascinating off-the-record conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Two or three, actually. Yeah, there, we did. We did. Some, sometimes, you know, like uh, when I'm first meeting someone or haven't mm -hmm. seen someone in a while, this is the case with you. We mm -hmm. kind of warm up and have a chat, and it's mm -hmm. so common that during those chats, I'm like, oh, I wish we were recording, but this was mm -hmm. a confidential conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're here again. I'm back at BioCybernaut mm -hmm. after... Welcome back. Yeah, at many years mm -hmm. away. Uh, those that are watching the YouTube video here will know that this is not my normal set. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember some pretty profound healing experiences in this very room when I went through the training. 
I guess it was 2015 or 16 uh, here in Sedona. So it's great to be back. Great to see you and see that you're still charging forward uh, with not only the center here, but the center in Germany and improving people's lives one by one, one brain at a time. <laughs> or two or three. Yeah, but yeah, a few <laughs> brains at a time, actually. Uh, so, you know, when, when I was, there's so many different directions I want to go, but when I went through uh, the program here, well, let's do all of them and we don't have to be linear. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So I'm thinking back to when I went through the program um, and sitting in this room, what I remember was uh, doing the brain training in my little booth. Mm-hmm. and um, proof chamber. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then I had no cell phone. Mm-hmm. There were no windows. I would come in at whatever time I came in. I had no idea what time mm-hmm. it was. And it was absolutely exhausting mm-hmm. to go through the training because of the energy required from my brain. And I just remember being like so discombobulated in terms of what, what time it was uh, and just kind of you know disconnecting from the world, which was great. But I remember being in here and doing the exercises on forgiveness mm-hmm. and then you know going back on the, on, the, on the QEEG and trying to determine whether or not I had well, truly... Well, it's not QEEG here. Oh, okay. That's a different thing. Okay. Yeah, on the EEG feedback. On the EEG, okay. And did you do the premium double or the single? Were you in the chamber once each day? Twice. Twice. Oh, so yeah. you w- were one of the early ones because that's about how long uh, I've had that uh, available for people. Okay. Yeah. And so I remember there was uh, an indication from my brainwaves telling me whether or not I had really done the deep excavation yes. of those resentments and things like that. So anyway, mm-hmm. I just remember, you know, there's Kleenex in this room. I remember <laughs> crying and I think the... the the sort of psychological part of it or the therapeutic part of it, I wasn't expecting, right? Mm-hmm. I just was like, oh, I'm going to optimize my brain and creativity and boost my IQ points. And then I came and I was like, oh man, this is some deep emotional work. So, Well, let's uh, direct uh, uh, some attention to that because this is not therapy and we do not bill it as therapy. Uh, the, there's a wonderful uh, man now passed, uh, Dr. David Hawkins, who actually oh my God. lived My, my all-time in, favorite teacher. Yes, he uh, lived in Sedona. Uh, I've met his widow. I was at a birthday party where his ashes were, uh, so I've been that close. But I've read a number of his books. And as you perhaps know, he had the biggest psychiatry practice in America. It was in New York City. And then he began to become enlightened and I think actually lived in a cabin alone in the woods for, you know, some months. Yep. Uh, and speaking as a professional and hugely successful psychiatrist, he said, letting go and psychiatry are not the same. Now, I'm referring to a recent book of his called Letting Go, The Pathway of Surrender. And I've actually done a paper in a British journal, EC Psychology and Psychiatry, comparing Dr. Hawkins' work Letting Go, The Pathway of Surrender, with Lesson 134 in the Course of Miracles, which is Let Me Understand Forgiveness as It Is, and integrating that with the Biosabernaut Forgiveness Method. So it's a wow online journal. Anyone can go I want to read look it. at it. Yeah. And so he said the goals of psychotherapy and letting go are different. In psychiatry, uh, they're not interested in helping you get rid of your ego. They just want to adjust it a little bit so you fit in better with other egos. He said in letting go, the goal is total liberation of the soul. And in doing that, you must confront the ego. Uh, You know, in Zen, they have the uh, five hindrances, doubt, drowsiness, distractibility, and worry, aversion, any form of ill will, and boredom, to which I've added forgetfulness (laughs) as a hindrance. Hmm. And these are the tools that ego uses to keep you crushed and vulnerable and not growing to your maximum potential and certainly minimizing any spiritual awakenings that you might have because then you slip the surly bonds of ego when you have those transcendent moments. And so we, (laughs) I've had, uh, when I was still in California, the training was not as powerful as it is now, I had a psychiatrist come to me and he said, Dr. Hart, I want to do your training. Um, you've trained a number of my patients and you've done more for them in seven days than I've been able to do in 20 years. I want to know what you're doing. But I'm very clear, we are not doing therapy. It's not the practice of therapy. We are teaching people forgiveness and letting go. 
And so it's a very important distinction because the goals of letting go and psychotherapy are different. And we believe we have, shall we say, higher goals. Yeah, yeah. That make, that makes a lot of sense. I like that contextualization. And um, God, speaking of, of David Hawkins, you know, I think the first time I came to Sedona was to see him speak. I was fortunate <gasps> enough to see him speak twice. Live? Oh, fabulous. Yeah, really, mm. you know, those being a, in the presence of a being at that level of consciousness mm-hmm. just changes everything. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate um, a few times in my life to be in the presence of great teachers like that. But I've listened to I don't want to exaggerate, but probably thousands of hours of Hawkins mm-hmm, talks mm-hmm. over and over and over and over mm-hmm. and over and over and over again for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. And um, I was always looking for, uh, you know, he would use kinesiology to calibrate yeah. the validity or level mm-hmm, of consciousness mm-hmm. or truth or falsehood of a concept, idea, teaching, place, thing, person, whatever. Which is fascinating because he's seemingly the first one that was able to use kinesiology or identify that it could be used for non-local phenomenon, which Mm -hmm. is, it's so meaningful. I think it goes over people's head (laughs) because they just, we have the ability to tell truth from falsehood. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. such a gift. But anyway, not many people have caught on yet. Uh, But anyway, my point is on one of those tapes, at some point, someone in the audience says, uh, ask a question about biofeedback and mentions a place in Sedona. I don't think they use the name um, oh. BioCybernaut. Oh. And they said, um, I, you know, I forget the question. It was like, does it elevate consciousness or is it real, basically? Mm-hmm. And he went, I don't know, let me see. And he tested on the arm. He said, yes. <laughs> So you got the stamp of approval from Dr. David R. Hawkins. I'm, I'm, there was, there's no other place like this in yeah. Sedona. And yeah. I remember thinking that. And that was after I had come here. And I thought, yes, I mm. didn't waste my money. Mm. You know, I already knew that I had benefited, but I thought that was really cool. We had a group in Mexico that worked extensively with muscle testing in David Hawkins' system. And they said that the BioCybernet technology in and of itself, without any of the guidance from the trainers, calibrated at 600, which is where Hawkins says enlightenment begins. Yeah, that's very high. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool. That's so good. (laughs) Yeah, and this will be relevant to people listening because I recently did a show uh, with a great um, uh, guy named Clayton who I've become friends with and he's a student of Hawkins and a master Mm -hmm. kinesiologist just Mm. for, you know, I don't know, 12 years. He's just done tens of thousands of calibrations and he's he's gotten really good at it and so we did a show and i'm hopefully going to do more with him where we Mm. calibrate different things Mm -hmm. for people that are curious about the you know the validity or the power and he tested a number of uh, different emf devices and stuff that i have Mm -hmm. because i was you know i i promote them on my show and my Mm -hmm. website and i don't want to promote anything that's fake and Mm -hmm. when you get into the sort of ambiguous world of emf harmonizing, yes. not blocking, right. it gets a little wonky, you yeah. know, it gets a little woo-woo. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't selling snake oil. And yeah, he tested some of these things and they were, you know, 560, 600. Mm-hmm. So it's really amazing to um, get that stamp of approval, I think, based well, on well, that. Well, since we've already gotten a little wonky, yeah, <laughs> uh, I could mention that uh, this uh, trainer who worked with me for a number of years here, um, actually, after he did his first... Um, Drunvalo, uh workshop, I think uh, Earth Sky or Awakening of the Illuminated Heart, he had a, a flower of life tattooed on his back. And when he was, I introduced him to uh, Hawkins, he immediately began doing a lot of muscle testing. We would, and I use pendulum rather than muscle testing. And so he and I would calibrate on the Hawkins scale, the level, the consciousness level of people on day one when they walked in, and near the end of day seven. And when we were doing the premium training, and we would do this independently, we were usually within a point or two and sometimes exactly wow. spot on with these two different methods. Um, we were getting 15 to 20 point increases on the Hawkins scale from the alpha wow. single training. And that's a logarithmic scale. It so is. So that's, and that's when profound. We, and when we went to the premium double, you were one of the first people to do that. We started getting increases that ranged uh, as high as 50 points. Oh my God. And when people came back and did multiple trainings, uh, then we found uh, that there were some people who had more than a hundred point increase over several trainings. Wow. That's profound. Very cool. (laughs) cool. Yeah, that's so neat. I wasn't even (laughs) expecting to go there, but now I'm kind of remembering actually when I was here that you, you did have a knowledge of a lot of different 
uh, sort of esoteric teachings and things. I, I would hear you drop, you know, A Course in Miracles or this and that. I thought, hmm, this guy's pretty tapped in. Um, for folks that are already lost and are going, what the hell are the guys talking about? <laughs> um, could you bring us back to the beginning when you discovered neurofeedback as a modality and and perhaps even, you know, who who discovered it or invented it, where it came from, and then when in the journey did you really latch on to this as something you wanted to pursue? Well, sure. There's a there's deep science here. Uh, and I've uh, spent most of my career uh, developing the science, uh, doing university-sponsored uh, research studies with both private grants and federal grants uh, to document the results in measurable ways that are recognizable by peer-reviewed science. And so, yeah, it goes uh, far out. Uh, but usually, only when people start manifesting uh, or they have brainwaves for unusual states. For example, uh, this is a little bit of a delay in getting to the science, but um, there is a brainwave pattern that I recognize as when this pattern occurs in someone, uh, they see angels. And so... Uh, at the end of the first day, when we're gathering uh, after the debriefing here in the canopy room, we go to the conference room and we bring up their brainwaves on the polygraphs and we look at them. And when I see this pattern, I'll ask the people, you know, if they see angels and sometimes they freak out. Like, well, how do you know? I've never told anybody. The biggest freak out was a U.S. Army Green Beret. I had the privilege of installing my technology on a secret army base for the purpose of training, giving the Alpha One training to two 12-man teams of U.S. Army Green Berets. Uh, and before we did their training, uh, I measured uh, with the three baselines that you're familiar with, the eyes open, eyes closed, and the eyes closed, white noise, counting the beeps. And uh, I, there are 24 guys, there's a lot of heads, so I taught them how to put electrodes on each other, and then I ran them through these baselines, and then I had a private interview with each one. And in one of the 24, I saw this pattern which I recognize as angel pattern. So big skinhead killer dude sitting across the table from me, totally <laughs> buff. And I'm going like, let's see, now how, how do I pop the question to him? And so I look at the numbers and look at him and look at the numbers and I go, do you talk to beings that other people don't see? Well, it was like I hit him with a two by four because he went back in his chair. He almost tipped over. He's, he's hyperventilating. He's having a panic attack. He's looking around like, did anybody else hear that? And he goes, how do you know? And I said, well, I see it in the numbers in your brainwaves. He goes, how do you know? And I repeated, I see it in the numbers of your brainwaves. He said, I've only told my best buddy on pain of death if he would ever tell anybody. How do you know? And I go, well, you've got what I call angel patterns. So then he calmed down and he said, well, when I'm doing my martial arts training, this old Asian Martial arts master shows up and he coaches me and nobody else can see him. And so it's a bit esoteric. It's a bit woo-woo. It's a bit wonky, but it's real science. And every single person who's ever shown this pattern, when I ask them, they might freak out. Like, how do you know? But they always confirm that that's the case. Now at BioCybernet, we say brainwaves rule. It's a simple way to say the psychophysiological principle, which is in scientific language would be any experience you have as a living human being, you can have that experience only when you have the appropriate underlying pattern of brainwaves. And when you change your brainwaves by any means, drugs, sex, rock and roll, you know, uh, meditation, Sufi dancing, shamanic drumming, when you change your brainwaves, you will change your experiences. And when you change your brainwaves enough, you can change profoundly who you are at an identity level. Now, when I shared this with Robert Diltz in 1992, one of the second-tier luminaries of the NLP movement, he had just written a book called Changing Beliefs. And uh, he said, well, with NLP, when you change beliefs, you can change all the behavioral patterns that flow from that. I said, Robert, that's really cool. Well, I'm here to tell you that with the BioCybernaut training, people can change themselves at a level of identity. And his jaw drops and eyes get big. And he goes, he said, the only thing I know that can change someone to a level of identity is a spiritual awakening. And I sat back and smiled. And I said, you said it, not me. And so <clears throat> we don't wear this on our sleeve. 
we don't typically put this on our website, but when you change your brainwaves enough and the right ones and the right places on your head, you will have profound spiritual awakening and you will live in an entirely different reality where there's more love and more understanding, more consciousness, uh, more capabilities. Ooh, simple uh, measures that I've made over the years on the Alpha One training are there's an increase in IQ that averages 11.7 points. And in my research, where we followed people up, there's no fading of this IQ boost even as far out as we've measured, which is out to a year. There's no hint that the IQ boost fades even out to a year. We've also seen an increase in creativity of 50%. That is whopping. At one point, I trained a group of Stanford Research Institute scientists, and they you know, shut off their work in their laboratories, gave up their lab time, and they came as a group several groups for the biocybernot training. Well, some of them solved in the alpha chamber problems that they had been unable to solve after two years of very hard and dedicated work. When Colin Martindale studied creativity in alpha in the mid-80s, he said, well, what he did was he, he took groups of creative people uh, known by the Indicea, patents, publications, paintings, uh, sculptures, uh, and he compared them with a demographically matched group of normals who did not have any of those indicia of creativity. No difference in the brainwaves at rest. No difference. But give the people problems to work on. Huh? The normals sit there in their normal brainwave state and do only as well as normals usually do. And the creative people immediately, and nobody knew how, turn on high alpha all over the head and quickly and effectively solve the problems in a manner that distinguished them as creative people. So Colin Martindale said creativity is simply a matter of having the right brainwaves. And that, and Tony Robbins, after he did the training, in fact, Tony was in that canopy bed when he was here. His wife, Bonnie Pearl, was here. After his alpha training, I've seen Tony live speaking you know, to his audiences saying, there's no problem that can't be solved in alpha. Uh, I would actually beg to differ because let's talk about the second type of creativity which happens in theta. In alpha creativity, what your brain does is it goes out into the vast storehouse of information that you've been exposed to maybe it's forgotten you don't have access to it but in alpha you have access to it and you pull together information from column w and column r and column c and you assemble it in a novel way and there's the solution to your problem but what if the problem requires information that you have never been exposed to maybe solving this problem requires information that no human in your historical time period has ever encountered. Mm, alpha's not going to be much help there. So what you need are theta brainwaves, which you can use to pull information out of the universal database known as the Akashic records. Akasha is a Sanskrit word meaning primordial substance. And in Theta, with the appropriate motivation, you can pull information not known to any human being in your time period to solve this problem. Wow. This is so cool. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> so in Alpha, mm -hmm. then, you, those brainwaves don't facilitate access to the quantum field of potentiality, but Theta brainwaves do. They and do, And so this yes. is why in a, in a deep meditation... Mm -hmm. A uh, float tank, different experiences that induce that theta, you pop out of that experience knowing something that you didn't know you knew because you didn't. But it, but it is known in the, yes, in it the is field. Known. So you can enter into the field yep. and capture that and bring it back as an intellectual truth that you can then apply. At the Global Consciousness Summit 1.0 that we just conducted November 21 and 22, um, I uh, showed brainwaves of a man who grew his company from zero to $200 million in just two years. And of course, he had unusual brainwaves. He had really big occipital alpha in the back of the head so he could be very creative. And he had simultaneously big frontal theta. So he could pull information out of the universal field, out of the Akash, and then creatively apply it in ways he could grow this company from zero to 200 million. Now, if he had gone to, well, you mentioned uh, like uh, Q, 
uh, uh, quantitative EEG, they would have looked at those brainwaves, compared them to a normative database, and said, oh my God, you have deviant brainwaves. We have to train those out of you. And they would have trained out the very giftedness that was responsible for his ability to grow a company from zero to $200 million in two years. And so I'm not a fan of training people toward normative databases. I'm, I'm never, I mean, the Zen master would walk into a place like that and they go, oh my God, you've got deviant brainwaves. You've got to make you more like the C student, the average. And I'm not a fan of that. Right. I'm curious with the, uh, with the brainwaves of those that are able to see angels and that, that indication that you would get, what does their brainwaves look like? Are they going to gamma or high gamma or is there something that... Oh, well, that pattern, some patterns are complex. <clears throat> I've developed brain energy maps, which show um, if you take <clears throat> head sites on this axis, frequency on this axis, and then you have cells, like 200 different cells, which relate to specific frequencies and specific sites in the head. And then you, then I've studied how brain activity at that head site, at that frequency, is or is not related, is it positively related, negatively related, to any of whatever mind state you want to measure. And I call them the cartography of consciousness or the brain energy maps. And so any state is going to be produced by a bewildering variety of brainwave frequencies in hundreds of different places on the head. And so when you can produce that pattern, then you manifest that skill or that ability. And so there are ways that you can train things. Some of the patterns, as I said, are very complex. The angel pattern is actually quite simple. Uh, In... 80% of all people that I've seen, I've seen probably 7,000 plus, 80% have their biggest alpha at the back of the head, occipital. And um, in these rare people, they have their biggest alpha at the centrals. Both centrals are bigger, left and right centrals, C3 and C4, are bigger than both occipitals, O1 and O2. But that's not the only criterion. There's also an amplitude criterion In other words, the centrals need to be bigger than the occipitals, but the centrals need to exceed this threshold and the occipitals need to exceed this threshold. Otherwise, if you don't have those two things, centrals higher than occipitals and both exceeding a specific energetic threshold, the experience doesn't show up. So I have two pretty cool stories about that. Um, One was... Uh, I was doing with Foster Gamble, and I really, really urge you to see his movies thrive. Uh, I just saw the second one yeah. a couple months ago when it when it came out. Amazing, mind blowing, amazing. Yeah, I, I'm just like, I wish I could force every human being on the planet to watch that movie. <laughs> I was sitting there going, Ah, oh, God, I hope this is huge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, over 90 million people have seen the first one, Thrive One. What oh, does good. it take? And so we can hope that Thrive 2, this is what it takes, yeah. is going to be similarly uh, successful. And we'll, for those listening, we'll put it in the show notes, a link. Oh, please, uh, yeah. yeah. Amazing, yeah. amazing film. Well, for some years, Foster and I were business partners. And uh, we did a company called Mind Center, which leased the BioCybernaut technology in order to offer these trainings. Well, at one point, we had two ladies come from France uh, one was a reporter working for the big French picture magazine, Le Monde, which is like look or life in the U.S. And uh, they were doing an article on American mind technologies, and our company name was Mindsetter, so they found us. So Foster said, well, we should give them a sample of the training. So we wired them up and you know, ran them through for a short while. And then I'm interviewing them, and the, the reporter lady, who was traveling with her girlfriend, had... Centrals higher than occipitals, but they didn't exceed the numerical thresholds. And so I really kind of put my foot in it because I said, oh, that's a very unusual pattern. And the reporter in her, like, she's on me like that. So, okay, well, what does that mean to you? And I go, oh, my God, I shouldn't have said anything because she doesn't have the power levels. And so if I go off talking about seeing angels, she's going to go back to France and write about Dr. Looney Tunes. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, talk about wonky. So I resisted for about a half an hour, but she was so good. 
And she was so persuasive. Well, 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 I won't hold it against you, but what I really want to know. And finally, I broke down. I said, look, there are two criteria. Centrals have to be higher than occipitals, but they both have to exceed this threshold, and you're not even close. So you probably aren't going to have this experience. She said, I promise I won't hold it against you. Please tell me. So I said, well, it means that you can see astral plane beings. And she breaks into this big smile. And she said, well, ever since I was a little girl in France, my beloved grandfather would take me out into the vineyards at night and teach me how to see wood sprites and elves. And so then I knew what the power requirement was for. The power requirement was so that these perceptions could be strong enough that they would break through the disbelief filter that almost anybody in our culture would have. If you have just a glimmer of something, ah, nonsense. Another glimmer, ah, nonsense. If it comes on full and it just stays there, as it does when you have high power, like one, for example, a woman came in and she had centrals higher than occipitals and all her scores were well over 2,000. And so I asked her, do you see angels? She goes, oh, there's hundreds of them around me all the time. So wow. the more of power wow. you have in this, the more of the angelic realm you can tune into. Right. Okay, so then another story. I'm in Canada, my Canadian center, and I have a man who's mid-30s, and he had, he had centrals higher than occipitals, and he was close to the threshold. Not Never went over, but he was close. And so I waited a couple of days uh, before saying anything, like we're day two in the training. And I say, you know, you have an unusual pattern, which is like angel pattern. And he starts to cry. I go, what, 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 what's wrong? And then this story tumbles out. You know, Canadians have a lot of ice, and so they play a lot of hockey. You know, they're nuts about hockey. And so he was seven. His father fashioned himself as a hockey coach, and he gets a little boy out on the ice. Well, immediately this angel shows up, and he's coaching the little boy in hockey. And he'll be in the situation, and the angel will say, shoot, and he shoots. He always scores a goal. Well, this infuriated his father because his father had given him a list of don't ever shoot if you're in this situation or this situation. And next game, he's out on the ice. He'll be in one of those situations and the angel <laughs> says shoot and he always scores a goal. His father got furious. And this got worse and worse until at 14, the little boy realized that he was either going to have to tell his angel to bug off or he was going to lose his relationship with his father. His father was so ego involved and that was just luck and you got to do what I say and I'm your father and all of that. And so he told the angel to bug off and it disappeared. Now he's 35 and I'm seeing echoes of that in his brainwaves and he's crying because he, he was torn up about having to say goodbye to his angel. So he said, can I get him back? I said, do you want to? I said, yeah, for sure. I said, well, ask him to come back. Next day, the brainwave power was a little higher. He was over the threshold, and his angel was back. Wow. So these are, well, at Biosabinant, we do what we call spiritual science. And for many people, you know, atheists or rationalists, uh, you know, this is nonsense. No, it's brain science. And uh, you, you talk about the quantum field. There's a lot more to reality than... People know, or even then they can know. I think it was Seth Sherrington who said, reality is not only stranger than we imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. Right, right. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's so good. So good. Well, and then going back to the uh, Akashic thing, um, I want to tell a story there because one of the most famous uh, examples of theta creativity in the scientific uh, record has to do with a, a Flemish, I believe, organic chemist named Kekulé. The new field of organic chemistry uh, had taken on kind of as a moonshot the synthesis of benzene. Um, benzene, had be, which is a hydrocarbon, um, I believe the formula is uh, C6... Uh, H6 or C6H12, something like that. It's just carbon and hydrogen. And uh, it had become an important industrial solvent. And there was limited natural supply. So the new science of organic chemistry undertook a moonshot. We're going to synthesize benzene. And Kekulé became obsessed with this. And uh, he would work late at the lab. 
take the last tram home, have a big meal, and then drowse in from the fire. This is like, you know, early 1800s, I think. And so there's no television, there's no radio. And the fireplace is the most entertaining thing in the house after dark. And so he drowses in from the fire and he begins to see furry balls moving around in the fire. Well, he grew up with fireplaces. He's never seen this before. And so uh, now a tennis ball is a furry ball, but each piece of fur is the exact same length. But Kekulé's furry balls, they were kind of like fuzzy, indistinct edges, but they were more or less round and they would move around. And he began to look forward to this. And so over days, weeks, sometimes the furry balls would bump into each other as they're moving around in the fire and sometimes they would stick. And so over time, they'd built up chains. And over weeks, maybe months, uh, the chains then would be, you know, undulating through the fire. And one night they were particularly frisky. And they, one chain started to play crack the whip. And it cracked the whip hard enough that the two ends spun around and stuck. And he knew in a flash that was the structure of benzene. He counted one, two, three, four, five, six. So he knew the structure of benzene was six carbon atoms in a ring with the hydrogen atoms stuck on on the outside. And he rushed back to the lab. He confirmed it was the case and synthesized benzene. Well, we now have a technology called the electron microscope. And if you take a picture of an atom with an electron microscope, you'll see something pretty close to what Kekulé was seeing, round things with fuzzy and distinct edges, and it's not a point at which the electron cloud stops. Five feet away from the nucleus, there could be an electron that's like on its way back, okay? So Kekulé, with his desire, late at night after a big meal, drowsy in front of Theta, what do you think he was running? Theta. Theta, yeah. And so, with strong desire, he pulled out of the Akashic Records what would become known to science a hundred and some years in the future, which is what atoms look like. Wow. Brainwaves rule. That's so awesome. It makes me want to go do a theta meditation. <laughs> Bring some stuff into existence. Or uh, theta training. We have theta training. Yeah, I know. Trainings. I, know. I'm gonna, I was actually going to get to that. I was going to get to that. Um, Wow, this is so fun. Oh man, I love conversations like this. Mm-hmm. Uh with with the uh the uh propensity for certain people to have brain waves that just sort of naturally show up so that they can access these kind of interdimensional mm-hmm. astral plane beings. Um, it brings to mind something that's fairly commonplace in the Joe Dispenza workshops. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Joe's work. Uh, I know of him. I don't know the details. So, okay, so Joe Dispenza, he's been on the show before. Great guy, brilliant. Uh, started as a chiropractor and essentially just got into consciousness work. And um, so I went to one of his workshops and um, it, it's largely based around these really long kind of hypnotic meditations. Mm. And so he's teaching you how to rewire your brain, essentially, mm-hmm. to make new neural uh, pathways by doing different meditations and even breathing techniques that I'm assuming he kind of borrowed from yogic traditions. In his workshops, he's got vast numbers of scientists who are doing testing and quantification on brain waves and a number of other metrics to keep refining and improving the meditative techniques that he's teaching people. Mm-hmm. There are certain people that hit anomalies in their brain waves during these events. And I don't, you know, he's probably referring to them in kind of a non-scientific, non-specific way, but he says he has people going into high gamma, things that are just extremely uncommon for your average person to be experiencing. And when the room hits this critical mass where enough sort of satellite brains are going into those brainwave states, these entities enter into the room Mm -hmm. And the people that are in those brainwave states see them. Mm -hmm. And it's a universal experience that's repeated over and over again from people that don't know each other, don't know that that's even Mm -hmm. possible or going to possibly happen. Mm -hmm. And it's become this phenomenon in his events. And so they do these coherence healings where you have one person who has some sort of physical, mental, emotional ailment and they're uh, laying down uh, with a circle of people around them and everyone around them is sending very specific intentions and prayers, et cetera. And it's most common that the people receiving the coherence healings will see these beings, these Mm -hmm. healing sort of giant beings enter into the room. Mm -hmm. 
and do healing on them. And oftentimes uh, what transpires is in fact spontaneous healings that there is no medical Mm -hmm. uh, account for. Mm -hmm. It just makes no sense. The Mm -hmm. person had a broken back and now they're walking like really crazy miracles. Mm -hmm. And it is common that it has something to do with these beans. Mm -hmm. And that sounds super far out to people. But again, like with your work, this is it's such a fascinating place where science and spirituality yes. meet because here you have in the back of the room a bunch of scientists, mm-hmm. right? With all the fancy gadgets and gear and screens and electrodes like you guys have here. And they can now pretty much predict based on what they're seeing in the brainwaves, who is going to have that type of experience and when. Brainwaves rule. It's just incredible. It's so exciting. <laughs> you know, and it's like, of course, I, I'm going back to a, an event in a couple of weeks um, in Florida, another another intensive. Of course, everyone in the room is like, when am I going to hit those brain waves? Yeah, you know, yes. and so there doesn't seem to be a, a reliable way for people in the audience to, you know, hit those brainwave states, you just kind of have to keep trying and hope for the best. Or there is a direct way you can do specific neurofeedback training on those brainwaves. Okay, this is what I'm getting at. Yeah. So could you take someone in, you know, the audience that Joe Dispenza, look at their brainwaves, have a model of that, and then induce that specific set of brainwaves using your training? Well, now you use a word which is a for. Bidden word. What, induce? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's uh, like entrainment. It encourage? Well, uh, how about train? Okay. Train. Right. Yeah. The brain, uh, I, I, I see a continental divide in uh, technologies. One is learning and another is do it to you. Like drugs are a do it to you technology. Uh, entrainment is a do it to you technology. Binaural beats are a do-it-to-you technology. Now, ecologists are very worried about invasive species. If you get a two-pound African toad on a Hawaiian island, pretty soon all the ground-nesting birds are gone extinct. Okay? As a brain scientist, I'm concerned about invasive frequencies. We have invasive species in ecology. Well, in the ecology of consciousness, I'm concerned about invasive frequencies. The brain is a multiply co-evolved system of frequency generators, which all have learned how to work harmoniously together. And when you come in with, whether it's binaural beats or pulsed electrical lights or or pulsed, even worse, electrical frequencies that you're injecting into the brain, you're producing chaos. It's like taking a garden of flowers and driving a cat nine... uh, through there, just devastating the natural ecology. And so I'm, uh, shall we say, quite opposed to inducing any frequencies that are not indigenous to that brain at that moment. Now, the principle of, uh, uh, well, for example, if somebody's in a swing and they want to swing high, if you stand at the back of the swing and push at the exact right time, If you push at the wrong time, the person's going to fall out of the swing. But if you push at the right part of the cycle, pretty soon they're swinging high and they're laughing and having fun. And so I would consider it unethical and maybe even immoral to entrain a frequency that is not known to be indigenous to that brain at that moment. I've actually written a patent on how to do ethical entrainment. It was granted on Christmas Day Several years ago, I didn't know hmm. the patent office worked on December 25th. <laughs> right. And so we measure the current dominant frequency in the brain in the last half second. And then that frequency is the only frequency that we would allow ourselves to entrain during the next half second. But during that next half second, we're measuring what's the dominant frequency. And if it's different, then we would change it. And so... And trainment is not something I'm fond of. If you give the brain information about is it doing something that would produce an interesting experience, let the brain figure out in its wisdom how to produce more or less of that frequency rather than forcing it to do more or less of that. It's more Got ecological. It. Got it. More ethical. So, so going back to your theta training, mm-hmm. so I guess for 
for context, when I did the, I guess it was the Alpha One mm-hmm. training here. Premium double. When I did that training, what I recall was we were teaching my brain how to recognize when it was producing a lot of alpha waves mm-hmm. and encouraging it to continue to do so. And as you went through the week, we gave more and more head sites for you to have feedback. So by the end of the week, you were getting feedback on your whole head, front, back, top, sides. Right. So if the purpose there is to uh, achieve some of the benefits you've described here, a higher IQ points, uh, 50% potential um, uh, um, creativity. creativity, you know, all of these things. And we can go more into that. Uh, what would be the purpose of the theta training? Is that, would you want to be producing theta as you're living your life? Or would you just get better at going into theta when you want to meditate or have little trips into the quantum and manifest things, etc.? Well, when I'm an Aquarius and when faced with an either or, I'll say both and. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, right. yes. And yes. Um, uh, for example, I gave the the guy who had big frontal theta simultaneously with big occipital alpha. And he was able to grow a company from zero to $200 million in just two years because he had both of those abilities. Or like Kekule, wanting to know the structure of benzene without an atomic microscope, electron microscope. Uh, or... At one point, um, I have worked since 2003 with people who do readings in the Akashic Records. At one point, my uh, favorite reader sent her best student. Is your favorite reader based here in Sedona by chance? Uh, Currently, she is, but she's my new favorite reader. I wonder if she wants to be interviewed. I've been wanting to do someone Uh, who's who's an Akashic Record reader, and I'm just kind of feeling out for when I meet the one, you know? Well, uh, I, I like her. Her, okay. her name is Kelly Jones. Okay. And uh, <laughs> with my first reader, I told everybody about her. And so pretty soon I had a two or three week wait to get an appointment. <laughs> yeah, shot yourself in the her. foot. <laughs> 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 Got it. Yeah, I know how that goes. Sometimes people covet their healers, you know, because they're like, they're so good. They're going to, they won't have room for me anymore. Like, for example, uh, a couple nights ago, I had an urgent question. I called her up at like 6.30 at night and we did a 20 minute reading. She was able to, you know, do that. But I've said her name, Kelly Jones, and I will give you her contact information. Lovely. Okay. Carry on. Carry on with your story. Okay. So uh, this woman, uh, I can speak in detail because she's now passed. Her name uh, was Ann Jensen. And in her tradition, there was a secret prayer that they would do. Part of it was public and then part of it was secret that they would use to open the hall of records for a person. And um, she came and she did Alpha One. She loved it. And her Theta increased. She came and did Alpha 2 and her Theta increased more. And then she came back and she did the Theta training. And after the Theta training, she didn't need the secret prayer anymore. She could simply turn on Theta and be in the Hall of Records. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, that's so cool. So explain to people perhaps how the training works. I always find this fascinating. My you know, sort of rudimentary version of it is this, that your brain is producing brain waves, which are signals that can be measured. And you're in a chamber, wherever you are doing your neurofeedback, those signals are being interpreted by a computer interface that is then sending feedback in the form of sights or sounds back to your perception uh, that then tells your brain do more of this or less of this. Mm -hmm. So it's like a way for your brain almost to communicate and observe, communicate with and observe itself. Mm -hmm. Would that be accurate? It's well said, yes. Okay. And so (laughs) I just find this so fascinating. Subjectively, this experience is like when I was here and I've done a lot of neurofeedback at home in LA to like just one off things and I want to sleep better. Or I'm too anxious. Or I want to focus more or whatever. Um, it's really interesting because your consciousness or higher self, however you want to put it is observing you in your physical body mm-hmm. doing the training. So there's this 
higher self intention to mm-hmm. it. But then there's the purely physical aspect of it, of your brain watching itself. So it's like mm-hmm. your brain's watching itself. And then there's a you watching your brain watch itself. And there's other perspective where you can be watching yourself, watching yourself. <laughs> right. I don't know if I've hit that <laughs> one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I had a recent uh, ceremony at home uh, with the, with magic mushrooms. And, mm-hmm. um, and I remember posing the question said, I think I was asking if the witness is watching the self, then who's watching the witness? You know, is there is there a witness to the witness? And no answer came. I just mm-hmm. kind of got stuck on it. Try Atman. Atman? Elaborate. Well, uh, you have the Manus, okay. the lower attached mind, the Buddhi, the higher intellect, and then you have the Atman or the Oversoul. Uh, In Tibetan Buddhism, there's over 150 attainment levels. And each one gives you additional higher perspective on all the levels below oh wow god it's such a complex (laughs) game this awakening because you know just when i think i've got it licked it's like well i'm actually able to kind of be in a waking state and observe Uh the phenomenon of mind emotions personality ego you know spend some of the time being aware like right now there's a me talking there's also a me that's watching me talking and observing the authenticity and spontaneity of the interaction and how i'm performing for you, with you, etc. But I don't know that I've ever gotten to the place where I'm watching that being watched. Mm-hmm. That's where it gets interesting. Well, one time, uh, long ago, I was working with a, a man who became a dear friend. Uh, he's passed uh, recently. His name was Gunnar Hurte. Brilliant. He was a Stanford MBA and a master's degree electrical engineer. And he knew silicon at the atomic level. He also knew management. He was a hot property in Silicon Valley. He had a formula. He would take uh, a two-year contract as a CEO of some high-tech company, $175,000 a year salary, 1% of the company. At the end of two years, they could not, there was no money in the universe that would cause him to stay with the company. He would go on. He had a quarter circle pin. He could take a company from here to here. He knew that was his sweet spot, and that's what he did. And he was so good that when he was coming off his contract, there'd be like 50 or 60 headhunters on him pushing choice job offerings on him. And uh, Gunner was, I mean, he made Mr. Spock look like an emotional, uh, you know, (laughs) wreck. I mean, he was so cold. Not unfriendly, but he was cold. He was non-emotional. Okay, on day five of his training, I go into the chamber. He's clearly in an altered state. He used to have an expression that if you weren't 100% rational 100% of the time, you were off your nut. It was his, oh, he's off his nut. He, there was a 10-second period in 10 years I've known him where he wasn't completely rational. He's off his nut. Okay, so Gunner's in this altered state. I go into the chamber. I can see it. And uh, we didn't have video cameras then, no stereo audio. So he's got his microphone, I've got mine. And he starts telling me that he's having his first out-of-body experience. He's out of body, and he's watching his body make love with a beautiful woman. He's in a third perspective, watching himself watch his body make love with a beautiful woman, and thinking, man, this is such a gas. (laughs) And I said to him, Gunner, if I would have told you five days ago such a thing was possible, you would have said... I'm off my nut. And when I said nut, he exploded in convulsive belly laughter. He couldn't stop laughing for 10 minutes. His stomach muscles ached for days after because they hadn't had that much uh, (laughs) exercise. And he was profoundly different. That happened in the Alpha One. Wow. Wow, what a fun gig you have, huh? (laughs) To see see people go through these experiences, (laughs) these transformative experiences. I don't know if there's any better life than to be a participant in people's evolution. So fun. Well, for a gardener, one of the greatest joys is to see the flowers or the vegetables, you know, bear things bear fruit uh, and be productive. Well, I get to watch people flourish to become what's been latent in them all their life. And suddenly they know it and they can live it and they are celebrating it and they're filled with joy. And, and I, people say sometimes, well, uh, don't you ever want to retire? 
And they go, well, what's retirement? Let's see. <laughs> retirement is supposed to be where you do what you want to do. I do that every day. <laughs> Why would I want to stop? Right. <laughs> do you do uh, neurofeedback training yourself? Absolutely. You do still? Oh, still. I mean, it's ongoing. Wow. All of the technology has come through me in the chamber. Wow. There's a medieval painting of a shepherd on his hands and knees with his head kind of like poking through a rainbow. And then there's the medieval idea of like outer space. And uh, it's like in, in the chamber, I put my head through into the other side and I see how the electronic circuits work. I see how the computer codes work. I used to solder the circuit boards together myself and write the code myself. Now I have other people to do that. But it all comes from the other side. Wow. Do you find after having done uh, so much training yourself that when you're not, you know, connected to the electrodes, et cetera, that you're able to drop into a theta state simultaneously or at will? Or is it possible for you or anyone that's done a lot of training to be able to, um, you know, you don't like the word induce, to uh, encourage alpha or different brainwaves? Like, do, do we have the ability or do you have the ability to bring up more or less of brain waves according to what you're trying to achieve in a moment? Well, yes, and we are embodied beings. We're bioelectromagnetochemical organisms. And so if you put a harmful chemical in like garlic or caffeine or alcohol, it's going to sabotage your brain waves and you're not going to be able to get to the state you wanted. A um, couple years ago, I was uh, feeling an... Um, uncommon for me uh, amount of anxiety. A little worry about this, a little worry about that. <clears throat> and uh, so I tracked it down. I have to confess to having been a catchaholic most of my life. Uh, people would ask me, do you want a little hamburger with your ketchup? I say, well, <laughs> a little, but not too much. I've walked out of restaurants that didn't have Heinz ketchup. That's funny. Because my fiance is the same way. <laughs> I hope she hears that she doesn't listen to my podcast, but she's obsessed with ketchup. Anyway, go on. Well, but so you funny. see, but you see, I had become sensitive to the point that Heinz ketchup and most other ketchups contain onion powder. And this onion, well, you know, the Arabs have a proverb. After the devil had done his dirty work in the Garden of Eden, when he walked out, where his first foot fell, that's where garlic grew, and where his second foot fell, that's where onions grew. So Brahmins in India are enjoined, forbidden, from eating onion or garlic. Uh, uh, Buckingham Palace does not allow garlic in the palace. Wow. They understand that it sabotages the brainwaves you need for creativity. I wonder if there's a correlation there with the vampire mythology. Don't know. Maybe vampires are super high, <laughs> high alpha. <laughs> yeah, I remember that going through the training. There was no caffeine, which at the time was pretty challenging. I mm -hmm. stuck with it, you mm -hmm. know, but I was a coffee drinker. I still am. I mostly drink decaf now. Uh, funny you mention that. Um, but yeah, no garlic, no onions, no caffeine. I don't drink alcohol forever mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, do you happen to know what's happening to someone's brain waves when they are under the influence of ayahuasca or LSD or psilocybin or any of those potentially consciousness expanding molecules? Well, remember brainwaves rule. Mm -hmm. Any experience that you have as a living human being, you can have that only when you have the appropriate underlying pattern of brainwaves. And so uh, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting, psychedelic chemicals do profoundly alter brainwaves. Now, um, I remember uh, working with a Danish colleague who had a portable EEG measuring, not feedback, measuring equipment that he took to Peru and measured brainwaves on ayahuasca ceremonies. And he reported that ayahuasca increased alpha at 0102, C3, C4, which are the four sites at which we train alpha from the very beginning, even in the alpha one training. Wow. So... But of course, you know, there's no need to throw up when you do the brainwave <laughs> yeah, training. I didn't throw up once. Yeah. Um. Mescaline, for example, has 13 alkaloids. One of them gets you high, the other 13 cause you to vomit. I noticed that. And so you take, you, you, you take uh, um, peyote yeah. and you remove those 12, make you throw up alkaloids. You're left with one, which is mescaline, and then you take that. Now, I know of studies, it was interesting. 
<sighs> synchronicity. Um, Dr. Joe Camilla introduced the human ability to voluntarily control your own brainwaves with brainwave feedback in 1962. I was in California. Also in 1962, LSD became illegal. One technology for mind manifesting psychedelic experience was taken away and another one was given. So shortly before LSD became illegal in California, Barbara Brown, an early researcher in uh, brainwave feedback, legally gave LSD to college students and measured their brainwaves, which is some fairly primitive, maybe only one channel equipment. And it was very interesting. She found that LSD made big alpha for some people and took the alpha away for others. And it divided it along whether they were visualizers or not. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you know that from being in the chamber, and we'll go back and do a little uh, more detail uh, description of the process. You'd ask for that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, The chambers are completely dark. Uh, the only time you get visual feedback are for eight seconds when your auditory feedback, which is pretty continuous in two-minute epics or in theta and delta training, they're three-minute epics. The audio feedback stops, and for eight seconds in alpha or 15 seconds in theta or delta trainings, dimly illuminated scores come up on a screen that tell you how much power you put out on different head sites on the left side of your brain, the right side, and other scores that tell you how well your left and your right brain are coordinating, how coherent they're becoming, you call it hemicoherence. And so when you have visual input, the alpha is suppressed. So if you do eyes open, eyes closed, baseline, almost always the eyes open, baseline, the alpha is tiny, and the eyes closed, it's big. I remember that now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if the visuals are caused by photons coming in your eye and being absorbed by the retina, it's as disruptive to your alpha as if the visuals are caused by the psychedelics. Wow. Okay. That's so crazy. So if you are a visualizer... Because you took masculine or psych, uh, LSD or whatever, um, do you have the visuals and it's like you have your eyes open and the alpha is suppressed. That's so strange. Fascinating. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. All right, check this out. I'm about to hook you up with the inside scoop on one of the most delicious and healthy products on the market. It's brought to you by Danette May and Mindful Health. And this is, of course, Danette's top superfood product from her Earth Echo Foods line. It's called Cacao Bliss. This is guilt-free decadence with some of the most powerful and pure cacao on the planet. This is truly how you unlock your bliss molecule and enter into a calm state of happiness. So you can enjoy that rich chocolate experience at the same time curbing your cravings. This is a superfood blend that gives you natural energy, mental clarity, and even reduces inflammation. They use 100% organic cacao beans that are naturally kissed by the sun, maintaining its miraculous health benefits. Then they blend it with turmeric, MCT oil, coconut, Himalayan sea salt, cinnamon, and black pepper for the perfect blend of superfoods. Now you can use this stuff in a cold smoothie, in a hot smoothie. The thing I really like about it is that I don't have to take all of these other herbs separately and try to create my own concoction, which I do sometimes terribly. So these guys have taken the work out of it and I just throw this stuff in whatever kind of drink. Sometimes I put it in, you know, like a buttered coffee in the morning. Sometimes I put it in a frozen kind of chocolatey smoothie drink. I just make up all kinds of stuff with this. But for the past eight years, Earth Echo has been a leader in the superfoods market and they've served literally millions of customers with this stuff. So it's paleo, gluten-free, keto, vegan, and vegetarian. Covers all the bases for those of you out there that are picky about such things. What I really care about is that it's totally natural, free of any swag crap, and it tastes delicious. It's also super easy to use. So here's what you do if you're ready to check it out. Again, what you're looking for here is a product called Cacao Bliss. You can find it at earthechofoods.com slash lukestory. earthechofoods.com slash lukestory course we have a hookup for you and that is luke 15 for 15 percent off you can also just click on the show notes and make it easy on yourself and once you get to that link you're going to find the cacao bliss and your life my friend will never be the same 
And now, back to the interview. In some of those experiences I've had, whether it be um, ayahuasca or bufo alvarius, toad, DMT. Bufo to <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, the ex- I've had so many positive experiences and I don't recommend, you know, that this is for everyone. But for me, uh, I've had some profoundly transformative experiences that have been nothing but positive. A few harrowing ones, you know, <laughs> too in there. Uh, but specifically with the ayahuasca, and with psilocybin, um, I think because I've been meditating for 20 years before I did any of that stuff, uh, I'm familiar with that, I guess, what is that theta sort of quantum access point Mm -hmm. where you're still aware that there's a body and you're in a room, but you're also somewhere else and you're having access to um, experiential information. Mm -hmm. I um, I wonder if in those experiences you're in theta because it it seems like what you're describing as theta being that access point to go into the quantum field and access the Akashic records or that vast information. It seems that some of those compounds have the ability to do that. Well, let's talk about 21 to 40 years of Zen. In 1966, two pillars of the Japanese scientific community, Dr. Kasamatsu and Dr. Harai, wanted to study the brainwaves of Zen meditation. So they went to Zen masters in Japan in two of the main Zen traditions, like Christianity has um, Protestant and Catholic. In Zen, there's Soto and Rinzai. And so they went to Zen masters in both traditions and requested permission to measure brainwaves on the monks while meditating, permission granted. Further, they asked the Zen masters to rate the monks for level of spiritual development. They did. Beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Mm -hmm. Nobody was rated advanced who had less than 21 years of practice. And some of them had up to 40 years. So in the Zen tradition, it's a minimum of 21 years to get to the point where you have the brainwaves of advanced Zen. No guarantee, because some of them had, had to go longer, but that's the minimum. 21 years minimum. And Zen meditation, Ramdas called it the steepest path and without any railing. <laughs> I love that. And when I trained a That's Zen funny. master, Ruho Yamada Roshi, um, he said several very interesting things. One, at the end of his alpha training, he said in his broken English, bio not better than having on Zen master. And I go, Ruho, you're a Zen master. How can you say that? He goes, listen, you have Zen master, master busy, many students. You sit, you meditate, you have attainment, master busy, not notice. Next day, master see you, see you different. Master give you feedback, one eyebrow go up little. At BioCybernaut feedback all the time. He repeated, BioCybernaut better than having on Zen master. Okay, so the Zen master in these two traditions, Soto and Rinz, I rated the monks, beginner, intermediate, advanced, Nobody was rated advanced who had less than 21 years. I've studied beginning, intermediate, and advanced Zen, as well as Zen masters. In fact, in Zen master, I discovered a pattern that I later knew, realized was a halo. There's a brainwave pattern for having a halo. We can talk about that in a moment. And so the pattern for advanced Zen, okay, beginning Zen, usually one to six years is beginner. Alpha increases only at the back of the head. In intermediate, which is 6 to 21 years, typically, that alpha spreads forward on the head. In advanced then, which doesn't begin before 21 years, those two things happen, plus two more. The frequency of the alpha slows a little bit, not into theta, it slows as alpha, and at the frontal locations, pure theta waves emerge. Wow. So that pattern of high alpha that spreads forward on the head <coughs> slows a little and then theta emerges at the frontal site. That's the signature of advanced Zen. That happens in seven days in the biosovernaut training. Now, people differ in how much their theta increases, but it always increases. And when people come to me after their alpha one and they say, am I ready for theta? And I say, well, technically... The only prerequisite for theta one is you have to have done alpha one. But let me look at your theta. 
And if they have produced a lot of theta along with their increase in alpha in their alpha-1 training, I say, fine. If not, I say, you maybe want to do alpha-2 or maybe even alpha-3 before you go on to theta. Now, when we were in Canada, uh, we had a scholarship sponsor um, who put up $6 million for scholarships, personal money. He sent people from his company, second largest oil and gas company in Canada. He said the ROI on a bio training was 100 If he paid $20,000 to send somebody to a training, the training that he got, the employee got back, he felt was worth $2 million. So he said the ROI on a bio training <laughs> wow. is 100 Wow. And this was a guy who, with one partner, had grown his company from zero to two billion dollars in two years. Very astute businessman. ROI in a biosabernet training is a hundred. Okay, so he also sent over two hundred Canadian Aboriginals, who, because of the racism uh, in the residential school system, which in some places continued up until 1989. Uh, caused many Canadian Aboriginals to be as traumatized as returning war veterans. 80% of all male Canadian Aboriginals have been sexually abused, and in some of the tribes, it's 100%. Wow. And so the abuse, the traumatization, the post-traumatic stress disorder is vast. So we trained over 200. Uh, at one point, I was invited to speak in Geneva at the United Nations about this work, and I actually published a paper entitled Reductions in Psychopathology in a Cohort of Male and Female Canadian Aboriginals, where we took these immensely traumatized people, gave them uh, the scholarship sponsor paid for up to three alpha trainings, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. One of the first to come was a very famous chief, Chief Victor Buffalo. He had been chief of the four Cree Indian tribes at the big Hobima Reservation uh, outside Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, after he had done his Alpha 4, because the scholarship sponsor gave him extra, uh, he said, Jim, I have a confession to make. And I go, Chief, what was that? He said, well, as you uh, suggested, I eliminated tobacco, alcohol, nicotine, onion, garlic from my diet before my Alpha 1. But after, I went back to eating onions and garlic. Now, when I came for my Alpha 2, I eliminated those again. But after my Alpha 2, I did not go back to onions or garlic because my consciousness had grown to the point where I could feel what it was costing me to eat onion and garlic. He said I was so into the, you know, the lost states of mental confusion and what do they call it, uh, the uh, rajasic temperament and the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. Uh, sattva is enlightenment, rajas is ego activity and will promoted by onions and garlic. And tamas is the principle of inertia or ignorance. This is why Brahmins in India are forbidden to eat onions and garlic. And so Chief Victor Buffalo actually came here to Sedona and as we were under construction and walked through the building doing prayers in Cree for the blessings of all the people who would come here. Wow. Yeah. Wild. Mm. You mentioned the PTSD, and I know that's you know not something that at least that I've noticed that you market about here. It's more about performance and enhancing your life. Um, but I have, um, I interviewed Dr. Andrew Hill in LA, um, neuroscientist, and I, I hope I'm quoting him right from our interview, but I think he said that neurofeedback can not just assist or help with PTSD, but cure it. Like mm -hmm. gone, done, you don't have PTSD anymore. Also TBI, traumatic brain injury. Right. It's, tell us a little bit about, about that. Well, the, the first, b before PTSD was uh, an official category, I trained a young man who had just come back from Vietnam, from the Vietnam War. He was a very muscular buff. He looked like he had just set down the weights. But he was so tense inside because his best buddy was walking point. He was right behind him. The best buddy stepped on a Claymore mine and he had to peel the pieces of his buddy off of him. He was so profoundly traumatized. And yet even the early form of the alpha training that I was doing back then, this might have been like 72, completely healed him of that incredible trauma. I remember he joined a, uh, a Christian commune after that. Hmm. And I've also worked with Gulf War veterans. Um, 
And uh, so, yes, it's, uh, it's a so profound it, healing. If you were working on uh, an issue like uh, TBI or PTSD, would that um, solution just be kind of embedded with the training that you already do? Or is that, would that be a specialized training to help someone with that issue? Um, well, you perhaps remember from your own training that each person's training is highly personalized to them based on their brainwaves mm-hmm. and also what comes up on their mood scales. Right. They're computerized mood scales, which uh, have the ability to detect emotions that are beneath the level of their conscious awareness. So, of course, they can't work on them. They can't heal them. Or if it's a good emotion, they can't feature it because it's unconscious. And so these computerized mood scales bring up those unconscious emotions so we can talk about it. You can get uh, strategies, go in the chamber and work on it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Cool. Wow. Fun stuff. Um let me see what else I want to ask you. I feel like there's so much we could cover and I, you know, I don't want either of us to be here all night, but I just get obsessed with this stuff. It's so fascinating to me. Um, you ask very good questions. Oh, great. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, okay. So w- when doing the training or if someone who just wants to be able to produce alpha, caffeine, not good, nicotine, not good, um, uh, garlic, onions, now, I know when I was here, I, I did follow the, uh, the rules as far as those things go, but I was, I got to be honest, sneaking some supplements on the side. So I think I was, I don't think I did modafinil because that would have been too much of a cheat, but I was probably taking paracetam or one of the racetams or something like that, some nootropic or smart drug. Have you experimented with any um, exogenous type of compounds to enhance the training at all? Or do you find that there's no point or that it's deleterious to the effect that you're trying to go for? Well, if people come and they are on any medically prescribed substance, I encourage them to continue that. Uh, One of the uh, amazing examples, when I was still in the university, um, I had the opportunity to train the wife of the second most powerful professor in my department. And she was on 17 different psychiatric medications. Wow. At the end of her training, she was only on one. And um, this was with the advice and consent of her physician. And um, she wanted her insurance company to pay for her training. This was long before brainwave feedback was, you know, an accepted uh, category. And they said no. So I said, okay, well, Come on down. And I, I got out um, an actuarial table. And we put in the information like what was her age? What, what was her gender? She's female. What was her education? What was her weight? You know, all that. And we came up then with an expected number, large number of months that she was expected to live. And we multiplied the cost of those 16 medications that she was no longer on per month times the number of months the actuarial table said she had left to live. And it was a number that was so hugely beyond the cost of the training that her insurance company gladly paid. Oh, really? (laughs) That's funny. Wow. That's really funny. That's really funny. So with someone who's having, you know, issues, psychiatric issues that would require medication, you know, obviously that has a lot to do with how your brain waves are performing or, or not. Um, but is there anything that would be able to enhance the brain's ability to become malleable or adaptive to the training? Um, you know, I'm well, trying to think of like, you know, PQQ or, or something that is known to in, improve uh, mitochondrial function or mm-hmm. something like that, which obviously your brain's using a lot of that energy uh, in the training is, are there anything that you've added in or is it just like eat a healthy diet, don't do any of the forbidden alpha killing foods uh, and that's it? Well, let me give you uh, two stories there. Um, we have had some vegans come to do the training. Now, as you know, your brain works harder in this training than it has probably doing anything else you've ever done before in your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Okay, so by day five, these vegans are typically looking for a piece of salmon. Okay, because they're not getting enough brain fuel out of their vegan diet. So there's one thing, proper nutrition. 
I remember one point Time Magazine said, salmon is the healthiest non-vegetarian thing you can eat. So I started eating a lot of salmon. Sometimes I would get sick to my stomach, sometimes not. And I found the difference was farmed salmon versus fresh salmon. Yeah. Because with farmed salmon, they buy fish meal from junk fish caught in the most polluted waters in the world and take it to these pristine waters uh, where they have the salmon penned up because it's the cheapest fish meal, okay? So, uh, but now before we introduced, right about the time you did your training, um, the before I introduced the premium double, in the single, we would sometimes allow people on day five, if the whole group, when they finished their alpha enhancement, the one session that we would do in that training per day, um, we would invite them if the group wanted to do more, we would, they could do extra. But the whole group had to stay together. And if everybody wanted to do more training, we'd say, okay, do you want to do 50% of what you just did? Do you want to do 20%? you want to do 80%? And whatever the smallest number was, that's what we would do because we didn't want to push anyone beyond their comfort zone. Well, then we started to have people come who were taking MCT oil. We've got three people in the group. They're all taking MCT oil. And every one of them wants to do extra. And everyone wants to do 100% extra. Mm, so we now make every morning before people go into the chamber a frozen blueberry shake with a vegan protein powder. And guess what? MCT oil. Yeah, definitely. I was I was for sure taking MCT oil. When I was doing the training here. Yeah, thank God because it does. Why is it so exhausting to to be? What you you alluded to before? What happens in the chamber? I want to give people a picture of that. So, kind of explain the process of what happens when you're in the chamber, and then why is that so? Why do you get so fatigued during this type of training? Uh, well. I'm going to answer that immediately, but then I'm going to jump to the bigger picture of the chamber is just one of the things that people do in the day. They, people, we, people, you asked earlier and I hadn't mm -hmm. gotten there yet. Um, people will throw out figures. Oh, we never use more than 10% of our brain power. Oh, we never use more than 7% of our... Where do they get these numbers that they make them up, I'm pretty sure. In the chamber, <laughs> you are using a much bigger percentage of your brain power than you ever have before. And so... The brain, like a muscle that's being asked to... Well, in physical fitness, people go for three things. Strength, flexibility, and endurance. In mind fitness, we go for three things. Strength, bigger alpha is better. Flexibility, turn it on, turn it off. And endurance, go longer and longer and longer and longer. Because hmm. some of the things, like gamma waves, only come out to play on the cortex after there has been a long period of stable high alpha. Oh, wow. Okay. Like wow. duck hunters going into a blind. You know, they make their noise and the forest shuts down. They have to sit there quietly for a long time before the forest comes back to life. So when the ducks fly in, they're not, you know, warned off by, hey, where's all the birds singing and, you know, the squirrels running? And so you have to be at peace in your brain for a long time before the gamma waves emerge. But, okay, the context. Um there's a conference room when people first come in, they sit at a conference table and they're given some coaching. Some It's like being in a, a class, a college class about the brain. The brain is complex and any meaningful brain machine interface is going to be complex and you're not going to be able to learn it just like that. Um, all learning is divided into two parts. There's learning how to learn and then there's the actual learning. Much of the first three days is learning how to learn. And then you can take all that information, you know what to do with it, you know how to do the procedure, the protocol, and you get in and you do it. Okay, so at one point, I was visiting the San Francisco Zen Center by invitation. They had learned, I had uh, studied the brainwaves of Suzuki Roshi, who founded that Zen Center. And he's the one in whom I first found the pattern that I recognized later, years later, as a halo a pattern uh, of brainwaves that produce. Oh yeah, halos. we got to go back to the halo thing when, yeah. when we're through with this. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that word up. Yeah, and so they had seen one of my papers showing, uh, which I published in 1993, that seven days of the alpha training produced the same brainwave changes as 21 to 40 years of Zen. I published that paper in 1993. And so I was teaching people, the biosabernaut training is like 21 to 40 years of Zen. 
did that for a long time. And so uh, they wanted to know more about this. So they had me up. Uh, we had uh, a ceremonial tea. Uh, and then we had a tour of the training center. They had a big statue of Suzuki Roshi. Everyone was very reverent. Um, and then we gathered back in the office of, uh, uh, I guess it was the Roshi. And uh, he says, uh, Dr. Hart, we would like to understand, because we don't understand, how you can produce the same results in seven days that we take 21 to 40 years to produce. There was no dispute, no argument. It was like, we want to understand. We don't understand how you can do this. And he said, and the reason we don't understand, he said, is because we know that you have to accumulate experience. And I go, experience, you're absolutely right on, that's it. Experience is the key. And, and so then I told him a story. Uh, my house in San Francisco was on Petrero Hill. It's a very steep hill. And I had put in terraces. Now, I'm a blueberry fanatic. And I had bought early season, mid season, late season blueberries. I'd had them shipped in. You know, I dug holes, uh, I built these terraces, planted the blueberries, watered them, put vitamin B6 to stimulate root growth. And then I went in my house. Next morning, I wanted to see how they had survived the night, my new blueberry plants, months in the planting. And all the blueberry plants were gone. They were ripped out of the ground and chewed into little matchstick type pieces and there were muddy dog prints and they went up the back stairs of my neighbor's house so i gathered a few of the twigs the chewed up twigs and i went up the back stairs and knocked on the door and say look at what your dog did to my blueberries and they were abusive they they yelled at me they swore at me they said it's your fault you should have had a fence and oh my so that night i'm in my meditation room in my house and this dog starts barking. I can hear it through the walls. I'm meditating. I'm trying to meditate. And my mind goes off on this rant. Like, oh my God, there's that dog. And why didn't they? And they should have been. Blah, 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 blah. Just, you know what those rants are like. 15 minutes later, I'm telling these to these Zen guys. 15 minutes later, I wake up and go, oh my God, I'm supposed to be meditating. And I bring my mind back. I say, that was one experience. You're right. You do have to accumulate experience. But it took me 15 minutes and I was probably quick because I was pretty experienced in my meditation. Now, how quickly do you accumulate experience at BioCyberNet? Well, at that time, we were doing only the Alpha 1 training. Each of the four tones, boom, 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 boom. The volume is adjusted 50 times a second to track your ever-changing brainwaves. So you're sitting there, and if you're paying attention to the tones, you're having 200 opportunities per second to learn compared to one experience in 15 minutes. And so your brain, wow. if you pay attention to the tones, and I ask people, listen to the tones as though your life depended on it. If you pay attention to the tones, your brain has more information than it's ever had before, certainly about itself. And what I found is that even children have an almost unlimited capacity to absorb, pay attention to, and remember accurate information about themselves. And so this is you listening to you. It's like you stand in front of a mirror. The mirror doesn't make you smile but if you want to learn a better smile, you can try pulling facial muscles in different ways. You get instant feedback. And so you're in there, you're listening to these sounds, which vary as the amplitude of your alpha varies at different sites in your head. And you have more information than you've ever had before. And you love it. And the brain loves it. And it sucks it up. And it works harder than it's ever worked before in your life. And this explains why you tend to get pretty fatigued mm -hmm. when, you, when you're doing this type of work. Mm -hmm. All right. That's cool. Um, what goes on in the chamber? You know, I remember being surrounded by all of these different speakers so that I could hear the tones. And at times there would be what sounded like a symphony, not necessarily a coherent symphony, but a symphony of sounds, uh, totally dark. And then we'd go through the mood scales. 
this, again, this is a few years ago, so mm -hmm. my memory is a little vague. But That's all accurate. Perhaps you could walk those that are trying to visualize this through that process. What, what are you actually doing in the training? Well, when you first go into the chamber, you will have spent some time in, in the conference room, having your head measured every day, carefully measured, electrodes put on, and getting uh, guidance, instruction. Uh, it's like a class, like a college class. Yeah. And uh, how the brain works and strategies, things you can try. So then you go in the chamber and, the and you get plugged in. Now, the brain waves are very tiny. They're just a few millionths of a volt. Uh, an eye blink, <laughs> tiny muscle that that is, is sometimes like 10 or 20 times bigger than your biggest brain waves. And so these tiny signals coming out of your head have to be amplified by our technology about 100,000 times for them to be big enough for our computers to process. Now, part of the processing is simple com conceptually. Most of you have seen a triangular prism with sunlight coming through it, and then the rainbow, the spectrum of colors. The white light is, de is spectrally decomposed into the color spectrum, which goes red, orange, yellow, green, teal, blue, indigo, violet. And so your brain waves similarly constitute a spectrum. And we want to pull out in the alpha training just the alpha. We don't want any theta in there. We don't want any delta in there. We just want, and we definitely don't want any beta in there. Increasing beta makes people irritable and impatient and even angry. And so you don't want any of those other frequencies. You just want the alpha. And you want pure alpha with no attenuation. So slow alpha, middle speed alpha, and fast alpha all will be treated equally, and they all run the tone uh, equally. Bigger alpha, louder tone. And so uh, as you are doing this, you're paying attention to what you're thinking about, uh, what's going on in your head, um, and you're also listening to the tones. And as the thoughts or the awareness is changing, the tones are changing, and your job is to pay attention. Brain is super good at correlating. It's a master correlator. And all you have to do is pay attention to the changing tones and the changing content of your awareness, and you will learn. You will learn really rapidly. And you pretty quickly learn. I mean, well, you know, like uh, Goldilocks. Now, this one's too cold. This one's too hot. This one's just right. They even refer to around stars, there are Goldilocks zones where it's not too hot, not too cold. You can have liquid water on the surface of a planet. And so you pretty quickly find out that your alpha is your Goldilocks zone, where you feel good, your body feels good, you're not under stress. Uh, and then as you build that, it goes from feeling good to cosmic bliss and then beyond. And you just work your way up. Amazing. Yes. So exciting. I love that things like this exist and that I get to share them with people. What's up with the halo pattern? Okay. So I had uh, on FM tapes, brain ray recordings from Suzuki Roshi and 30 of the monks that he brought uh, to be measured during their Zen meditation. And my first job following um, my getting my PhD was to read the assembly code of a Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-15 mini computer that uh, was in the EEG Systems Lab at Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute in San Francisco. It was a part of UC San Francisco. And so this brilliant programmer, Alan Gevins, had written this program in assembly code that would do power and coherence spectral analysis on brainwaves. And my first job was to read the code and document it. And so once I read the code and documented it, I knew the program better than the programmer. And so on Christmas Day, when the whole hospital was shut down, I let myself in, mounted the tapes, and began playing the tapes through this analysis program and making graphs. Now, some of the things uh, like the coherence, you can get 100% coherence on just noise, just by random. So what I found is that you had to do an amplitude threshold on the coherence. So you wouldn't report the coherence unless there was at least a minimum amount of amplitude. And when I did that, amazing patterns. First of all, I confirmed everything that Kasematsu and Harai had found 
beginner's end, a little bit of alpha at the back of the head, intermediate spread forward in the head, advanced slowing, and frontal theta emerging. But I saw in the coherence a pattern that I had never seen before in the Zen master, which was simultaneous coherence in alpha and theta. Simultaneous, not one and then the other, but simultaneous. Now, that was mind-boggling because I had never known that that was possible to run alpha and theta at the same time and certainly not to have them coherent. This pattern of bimodal coherence was seen in only one of the 30 monks that Suzuki Roshi brought with him. Happened to be in advance then. And I, because this man is now passed, Suzuki Roshi is passing this man. I can say who it was. It was Richard Baker, who was in advance then. And uh, one out of, yeah, I know I'm a scientist, so one out of 20 is all you need for statistical significance. So this is one out of 30. I knew it meant something. I didn't have a clue what, but I made a presentation at a scientific conference. Oh my God, power and coherence of Zen meditators and the Zen master and one of the advanced Zen, they show this unusual bimodal coherence pattern. That was it. I went back to working on the technology. Seven years later, Suzuki Roshi died. It was a conscious passing, like, uh, next Thursday I'm leaving my body, come on by. There were 45 people in the room. And when he died, some of the people felt something leave the dying Zen master and going to somebody else in the room. It's called giving transmission. The man to whom he gave transmission was Richard Baker. Wow. wow. Oh my God. Yeah, it's very exciting. Now this, wow. caused, this caused a bit of a scandal in the Zen community. Oh, why did, Ro- why did Roshi do that? Well, I knew why Roshi had done it because of all the monks around him, he was the only one who had a vessel capable of receiving energy that the master was about to drop when he left his body. So now I do another scientific presentation. Ooh, this is a, a marker for Zen Roshi. Let's, let's you know, celebrate what, uh, what did it mean. I didn't have a clue. So now we fast forward, maybe 10 years more, uh, and I'm at a conference on the East Coast on chaos theory as applied to analysis of brainwaves. Uh, It was a lot of military intelligence people in the rooms, like 2,000, 2,500 people, big auditorium. I was in the next to the last row. And a lot of the papers were highly mathematical, you know, Dells and curls and things like that. I understood it all. I was a math whiz in high school and college, but it wasn't that interesting. Then, uh, just before lunch, uh, they introduced a guy uh, named Dr. Arnold Mandel. And I knew from the introduction this was going to be different. He had been the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at UC Davis. Mmm, power, prestige. I mean, psychiatrists get to say what normal is. Immense power in our culture. He gave all that up because he loved math so much. And he went from being chairman of the psychiatry department to a low-ranking mathematician in a math department because he loved math so much. So he gets up and he starts talking about brainwaves follow Fibonacci scaling. Now, you know Fibonacci numbers invented by the Italian mathematician Fibonacci are you start with one and zero and you add them together and you get one and then you add one and one together and you get two and you add two and one together and you get three and you add three and two together and you get five and you add the Two previous ones, you get the next one. Well, except for the first few, the ratios of all Fibonacci numbers and they go out, it's an infinite series, are never resolved to a rational number. It's always irrational. Now, Fibonacci numbers are deeply embedded in nature. When a little plant comes out of the ground and puts out its first leaf, the plant is smart enough not to put the second leaf directly above the first because it would shade it and waste resources. So the second leaf is set off by some angular degree. And as you go up the stem, it's a Fibonacci number before you get one leaf that's directly over one below. So plants that's know fascinating. Yeah, plants know Fibonacci numbers. Wow. And so if he said brainwaves follow Fibonacci uh, scaling, that would mean the center frequency of delta if added to the center frequency of theta would equal the center frequency of alpha, which it doesn't. And I'm, you know, in the back, you know, growling. And, uh, but then he quickly resolves my, my, my uh, discomfiture by saying, well, you see, delta is not a monolith. Delta is actually two different brainwaves. There's slow delta and there's fast delta, and they have different generators in the brain. They go, okay, so if you had the center frequency, low delta, center frequency, high delta, you get the center frequency of theta. Then you had center frequency of high delta, and theta, you get center frequency of alpha, and it all works. 
Whew, okay. So, <laughs> you, you know, but, you know, it's, it, well, I'm, I'm interacting with him uh, in a most enjoyable and entertaining and, and informative way. And then he's working with a transparency and a grease pencil and a projector. So everything he draws here is projected for this audience of 2,500 people. And he draws the occipital lobes of a monkey brain. And then, and you might want to go to, in the uh, Global Consciousness Summit, I did an actual paper on the brainwaves of halos. So uh, I go through, I actually, oh, okay. I actually have graphs and stuff in there. So, um, so now we have two frequencies, theta. Remember, we had coherent alpha and we had coherent theta. So we have five hertz and 10 hertz. So he says, okay, well, you take a line that's five and then a line twice as long is 10. So you take the five line and you revolve it around, it makes a circle. Then you take the 10 line and you revolve that around. And what the circle does is it sweeps out a volume, which is called a torus. Well, when he did that, I did something I've never done in my career before or since. I leaped out of my second to the last row chair, cut my hand, shouted at the top of my lungs because the stage was a long ways away. I've got two people in my database who showed that pattern. One was a Zen master and the other got transmission when that Zen master died. Now, Dr. Mundell was most gracious and uh, said, please, after my talk, come up. Now, as a side story, as I said, there were a lot of military intelligence people in the room. My outburst there won me, a few months later, an invitation to a CIA or NSA safe house in Savannah, Georgia, <laughs> uh, where I was uh, invited to come to present. And, I mean, of all the speakers who were there to present, I was the only one allowed to stay all week. So I got to see all the things that everyone uh, presented. And they were freaked out that a civilian knew the things that I knew about brainwaves and consciousness and stuff. Um, and so, you know, it had that story had legs. But, okay, now the lunch bell rings and everybody empties out. I walk down. The first foot I put on the stage, Dr. Mendel says, you must be a physicist and a psychologist. And I go, how do you know that? He says, well, only somebody with those backgrounds could possibly have this data. And so then we talked for a long time. Now, because what I had seen was this pattern of coherent theta and coherent alpha simultaneously produces over the head a torus in phase space. Wow. And if you ask any PhD level electrical engineer, what happens if you can involve a coherent uh, signal, you know, well, you'll get a torus in phase space. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's, it's not esoteric. It's like if you take an oscilloscope and you feed in a 10 hertz signal in the x-axis and a 10 hertz in the y, you get a circle. And then if you make it a 10 hertz and a 20, you get a figure eight. And so these are called Lissajou patterns. Well, this is a three-dimensional Lissajou pattern. And we know people have seen this because you can go back to the five and six hundreds AD. And when painters were painting saints, they put halos over their head. So that's so wild. This is an amazing story. <laughs> so is that then when you have the coherent alpha and theta making this halo, is that a magnetic field, this torus field? Well, that's a good question. I mean, the fact that the torus exists in phase space, um, is it a mathematical abstraction? It's certainly visible to many people. And it's not just Christian because the Buddha is often depicted with a halo. And so is Krishna in Hinduism. Krishna and his wife are often depicted with halos as well as Jesus and the angels and the apostles. And, and there was one painting, uh, Dr. Jerry Pittman, who'd done the training when I shared this with him, he went off to art libraries and gave me scores of color Xeroxes of religious paintings of halos. And there was one painting of Jesus and the apostle, and the one apostle had his halo at about a 45 degree angle over on one side of the head. And I go, oh my God, a brain asymmetry. And rarely, maybe one in 100 or one in 200 people will have like 10 times more power in one hemisphere than the other. And that would pull the halo over to that side. So right now, if you give me a painting of, or a photograph of a saint with a halo, I can make measurements of the major and the minor axis and calculate backward and tell you what brainwaves have to be running in that saint's head in order to produce a halo of that size and orientation. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so then is that pattern uh, uh, indicative of enlightenment? I mean, would, would is, well, 
Is is that an indicator of what we would, you know, just... Halo, for lack of a better term, I mean, just a blanket term, enlightenment, when one has transcended. Well, you know, Hawkins said enlightenment begins at 600 Mm -hmm. on his scale. Um, Jesus, when he was in a body, was a thousand. Uh, At one time, a passing archangel who sent him a thought that brought him out of his slew of despond, he calibrated the archangel at 50,000. And so, you know, that's one scale. Uh, I'm, I'm fond of saying that uh, it's possible for you to, uh, well, I formulated the first axiom of biofeedback in 1970. Any process in your brain, mind, or body about which you can be given accurate and immediate information, you can learn to control, whether that's your heartbeat or the uh, acidity of your stomach or your muscle tension or your brain waves or the pattern. Now, halos are a pattern that emerges in phase space when you're running a certain pattern of bimodal coherence. Now, you could run coherent gamma and coherent alpha, and that would be a different shape of halo than coherent alpha and coherent theta. But halos are a cross-cultural symbol of spiritual advancement and ethical purity. Buddha, Krishna, Christianity. When uh, there was, maybe decades ago, uh, there was an election and a whole bunch of freshman congressmen went in under the direction of, I believe, Newt Gingrich. And I remember there was a cartoon in the newspapers of Newt Gingrich in a little uh, kiosk outside the Capitol building and the freshman congressmen were lining up and he was handing each one a halo. The idea we were going to have now ethics in government. (laughs) And so halos are a cross-cultural recognized symbol of spiritual advancement and ethical purity. Do you call it enlightenment? Well, in what scale? Right. Right. I think it's probably better to have one than not. Yeah. 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 So relative, I guess. Wow. Dude, fascinating, fascinating stuff here. Um, I think uh, a lot of people are going to hear this and want to get in on uh, neurofeedback and what you're doing here at BioCybernaut. And I hadn't been on the website in a while, but I was going through just kind of, you know, reacquaint myself with your work and formulate my questions. And um, I thought, oh, let me just see what the packages are and how much they cost. And there were a, a number of different programs now available that I, I don't know that were when I came in, but it's quite expensive. You know, I mean, we're talking fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to come for five or seven days. If I'm if I'm not incorrect, or fifty to eighty thousand if you want to train with me. <laughs> okay, I didn't see. I guess there were some shocking numbers on there. So, um, you know, that's it's sometimes I cover things on the show that are so profoundly useful and transformative. And um, at the same time, I often feel bad because they're not available to all people for whatever their, you know, socioeconomic situation might be. Let's address it directly. Uh, One, there are payment plans. um, And uh, there are some places where people can apply and get uh, um, loans to do the training. But Let's talk about... That's what I did. I borrowed it from Visa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I came. So, well, let's talk about the, the payoff because there's a book that we give out. We probably got a free copy, uh, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 uh, by Dr. Travis Bradbury and Janine Greaves. And everyone who comes for training now will take their online test. Uh, it's paid for when we buy the book and we give the book to you. You take it at the start of day one and at the end of day seven, it measures emotional intelligence. Well, as you look through the book in the first few chapters, it points out that emotional intelligence is the master skill for success. Uh, IQ maybe accounts for 10 or best case, 20% of your success in life. Where emotional intelligence or EQ, they say, accounts for 58, almost 60%. So three to six times more important for your life success than IQ. I mean, you can be the smartest guy Hmm. around, but if you can't relate to people, you can't have employees, you can't be an employee, you can't have investors, uh, you just can't relate to people because you don't have the emotional intelligence. So they've actually studied EQ all around the world in different cultures, in different economies. Uh, And so they found using as an average... A, a salary boost from a boost in EQ that includes India and Pakistan and Seychelles and uh, you know Burma and uh, as well as Germany and France and you know England and 
uh, Canada and the U.S. and Japan, the average boost in your annual income from a one-point rise in EQ is $1,300. Now, and that's global average. If you're in a first world country with more opportunities, it's likely to be much more than $1,300. But even if you take that global average, $1,300, and you multiply it by the average EQ increase of our Alpha 1 premium double training, which is 15.8 points, you get a number north of 20,000, which is more than people pay for the premium double training. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I didn't, I didn't know the, uh, the metrics of that when I signed up those many years ago, mm-hmm. but I got to say, I think it was 15,000 when I did it. And I did, I mean, I probably had like a few hundred dollars in the bank. You know what I mean? Uh, I used to have problems with credit cards. I've, I've since remedied that. I don't, you know, I don't borrow money that I don't have something to back it up with a uh, hard lesson, but I remember putting it on my credit card and I just had to hope and pray mm-hmm. that something mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. like what you just described was going to happen. And, you know, now here I am all those years later and mm-hmm. it still would be a chunk of change for me, but not something I would probably have to put on a credit card um, yep. for that long. So, um, you know, I felt like it was a, a worthy investment and mm-hmm. my success I'm sure has had something to do with, at least in some part, the health of my brain and my ability to access these different brainwave states. But I did want to bring that up because I know Mm -hmm. sometimes people will write into the show and be like, oh man, everything, you know, all these improvements and biohacks are so expensive Mm -hmm. and it's a rich person's game. And I always tell people that the best biohacks are just nature. (laughs) That's the number one answer to that. You know, you don't have to do all this fancy stuff, but um, but I also just want to like prepare people for that and give them an understanding. And and also I think um, when someone hasn't gone through a training like that, it's difficult to uh, understand why it would cost that much money. Mm-hmm. But having been here, when you look at all the equipment and the number of staff and like the attention going on, I'm sure that the overhead is um, not cheap to run kind of an operation like this. Uh, and the other thing about it is, is that getting to know you even more today and having spent uh, a week with you those years ago, uh, you don't seem like a guy who's in this for the money. I don't get a salary. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> so and money that comes in goes into the technology or into the staff or right. whatever. So yeah. So I appreciate your heart, and uh, you know it's no accident that you're you're named Doctor Hart. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, I just you know I appreciate the work that you're doing, and you know I hope that people can find a way to make this accessible. Uh, do you foresee at any point in the future as this type of technology? Uh, emerges as commonplace that the demand will, in, in a universal way, lower the cost to make it less prohibitive to people? Well, of course, there's two, the answer is yes, uh, but there's always two ways to do that, is to provide more money. At one point, I wanted to know what the U.S. defense budget was. Um, and it was uh, 2008, the numbers were classified all the way back to 2004. And so the U.S. defense budget, which included the Coast Guard and Homeland Security and things like that, just half of that would have provided the training to all adult North Americans. Oh, man. Okay. At which point, everybody would be so much more creative and, you know, so much higher emotional intelligence and uh, wouldn't need the same kind of defenses because we would creatively discover and invent and put in place new forms of defense. Uh, And so just half then. Now, uh, when we had a $6 million scholarship fund in Canada, uh, this paid for the airfare and the hotels and the taxi and, you know, and the training fees of over 200 Canadian Aboriginals, as well as people from the philanthropist's uh, company. And so instead of trying to make the training cheaper and cut this out and cut that out and cut corners here, let's just come up with more money. What I learned when Mm. I had my first federal grant, um, you don't have to have money to spend money. There was the money, wasn't mine. I couldn't buy an ice cream cone with it, but I could hire this person. I could buy a computer system. So you don't have to have money in order to spend money. And so the Goethe quote that we read on day one of every training uh, includes, once you commit, then providence moves too. 
raising in your favor all manner of unforeseen meetings and material assistance that no man or woman could have dreamed would have come their way. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, Yeah, that's so true. You know, I'm a huge proponent of um, vision work. Vision, you know, I used to make vision boards. Oh, yes. It was just awkward when I was dating because then you'd forget your vision board was out. (laughs) (laughs) Who's that woman? Who's that woman? (laughs) A bunch of bunch of bikini clad ladies on my vision board, and one will just walked in my room, so that got awkward. Um, But there were just other private affirmation. I'm kind of joking, but not really. And then I started making vision books where I get these kind of big, you know, whatever the eleven by fourteen books, and I'd cut out pictures and affirmations and all the things, Um, and you know, they worked so well that I'd have to make a new one every year because mm-hmm. so many of those things, and one of them was coming to this training. Mm. And I had to eventually take it out of the mm-hmm. book because mm-hmm. mission accomplished, I had done it. And there were all <laughs> sorts of, you know, $15,000 <laughs> biohacking doodads. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh man, I'll never be able to afford mm. that, says the, the conscious mind. Um, but after many years of vision work, uh, now I actually do videos mm-hmm. and I put, you know, really meaningful music mm-hmm. uh, behind it. Well, someone made it for me, my mm-hmm. friend Bree just made me a new one. Um, and, and now she uses Photoshop and she'll take a picture of me and superimpose it somewhere that I want to be, Ooh, you know? Yes. So it's like a, a beautiful home or a vacation or whatever it is. And, or she'll put me and my fiance in front of our dream home and we're in the hallway just standing there and, mm-hmm. you know, they look pretty <laughs> real too. And I'll just... I'll invoke that feeling of gratitude as if that that event has already transpired Mm -hmm. because as we were talking about in the quantum field of infinite potentiality, Mm -hmm. it does exist, right? So, you know, buying into that and really working with that, um, I think is so powerful. So I might leave people with that and, Mm -hmm. you know, to the point that you just made is that these things seem to be out of reach for many of us, but if you know the right tools... yes they can become part of your reality. And I'm living proof of that. I mean, I don't come from money, man. I used to be a pot dealer and a waiter. Like I have no (laughs) credentials, training, education, nothing, you know? And here I am and I'm experiencing some of these these things that I I share about on the show and I'm manifesting Mm -hmm. them for myself in the same way that people listening to this show can for themselves. So, you know, there's my, you know... um, encouragement for people that feel like they're excluded from the party. Like you're only excluded because you haven't yet mastered the techniques of manifestation and bringing into reality what you really want. Well, and to underscore for everyone, uh, the key elements there, you talked about you'd have the feeling. Yeah. Just reciting words, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. It's not going to get you very far. But when you can manifest the feeling of how you will feel when you are whatever it is that it is you want to be, Cultivate that feeling, and while cultivating it, allow yourself to drift down first into a deep alpha state and then into a theta state. And that the reality will take the impression of that feeling and shows up pretty quickly. Awesome. I love it. All right, I got one closing question for you, man. This is a, this is a, this is really fun. We're almost at two hours here. I know when time disappears mm-hmm. that we're it's going to be a great episode. I've, at this point, I've done over three hundred something of them, and I have a pretty good sense of when it's really going to be useful to people. So thank you so much. You're I think so people are really going to benefit um, and just be entertained by this whole thing we've gone into today. But my closing question: Let's do yeah. the time thing. Ramdas said, "If you want to live high." You have to live outside of time. Suzuki Roshi said, time is the basis of fear. I was 26 when I heard Ram Dass say that. If you want to live high, you have to live outside of time. So sitting in my gym clothes on the carpeted floor of my apartment on Noe Street in San Francisco with a big imaginary samurai sword, I spent three full days thinking of what ways I might be connected to time and when I found one, I would cut it. For three days I did that. Later, psychics were to say to me, Jim, your nature is that of timelessness. Hmm. If you want to live high, you have to live outside of time. Wow. Wow. That brings to mind something, uh, speaking of manifestation and just having goals and dreams come true. Uh, prior to coming over here today, I got an email from someone at Sounds True, the publishing house that represents so many amazing spiritual teachers and uh, 
and they want me to do a show about Ram Das. He's wow. one of my all-time favorite teachers. Oh, yes. Unfortunately, I was unable to get him on the mm-hmm. show, but uh, one of his cohorts is going to come on and we're going to talk about his teachings and life and work. I just got that email before he came over here. Fabulous. Like, yes. <laughs> so, you know, Congratulations. It, it, really, it really does work. This stuff works. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, yeah, and I noticed you mentioned him a couple of times. I thought, oh, he's around. You know, he's around. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, my last question for you is you've taught me so much today and in my prior experiences with you. Who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you might share with the audience? Well, of course, Ram Das. Okay. Uh, uh, I would listen to, uh, he, when he would come to the Bay Area, I lived in San Francisco, he would be on KPFA from midnight to dawn. And I would tape record these um, talks on reel-to-reel tapes. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. And then I would play them. One time there was a guy on who called in, and I would call in from time to time, talk to him. At one point I did a, uh, a retreat with him meditation retreat in person. Um, And this guy said, you know, I've heard you talk about your teacher, your guru in India, uh, so many times, but you've never said his name. Would you be able to say his name? He goes, yes, of course. And he starts talking. And he talked and he talked and he talked and I never heard the name. Aha, but I have it tape recorded. So I played the tape, listening for the name. I didn't hear it. It wasn't until the 10th time, I count it, the 10th time when I went played the tape, I heard him say yes. And my guru's name is Neem Karuli Baba. And so that was obviously embedded and you had to attend. You had to rise to a certain point in consciousness before you could see. I think at one point, Ram Dass was taken on a hike in the Himalayas, uh, very high up, way above the tree line. And they came over this little lip and there was this huge bowl-shaped valley, very steep uh, walls. It's all rock. And he looks at his guide like, uh, like, why'd you bring me here? And the guy goes, you know, tune a little deeper. So he tunes a little deeper, opens his eyes, and the entire bowl-shaped valley, like an amphitheater, is filled with these old, old yogis, like shoulder to shoulder. And the guide said, these beings are here holding our reality back from chaos except for these beings being here this all this entire reality would dissolve into chaos and so hmm okay so you have to tune i had to tune 10 times in order to do that um certainly uh, yogananda was a powerful teacher i was initiated into kriya yoga by one of his direct disciples uh, swami kriyananda the ananda karapada village uh, and I have to credit uh, Rick O'Dell, who was a grad student in phenomenal, phenomenological psychology at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. When he and I met, the first summer I didn't go work on my family's farm for harvest. I stayed behind to work at the computer center. And that summer I met Rick O'Dell, who taught me like Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the phenomenon of man, started to teach me about consciousness. Uh, and I loved it, but something was missing. Like, it's all, it sounds great. It's all philosophy. It sounds wonderful. But how do you measure it? And then in the senior semester of my senior year, when I came out of the student union after lunch to confront a big hand-painted sign where every letter was a slightly different color, it said, Dr. Joe Camillo will talk on brainwaves and consciousness. And the time was, oh, 10 minutes from now. The building was right over here, Margaret Morrison College, and I did not have a class. And so I went and suddenly I knew. This is the technology to measure consciousness. Wow. Now I had to transform the field. They were using measures like percent time that suffered from gauge invariance, like a rubber ruler. So I, and I built my technology. I built the filters, the world's best analog filters. I built the world's first micro computerized brainwave feedback and analyzer system in 1978. So <laughs> I've, you know, I've had to create the tools to do this. Oh, man. But it all came from the other side. In the chamber. Wow. Well, Jim, man, what a mind-blowing conversation. Just when I think I've done the be-all, end-all podcast, I have one like this, man. Thank you so much for spending time with me. It's <laughs> a what, delight to hang out with you. Yeah, wonderful to be back here on the premises where all this magic <laughs> takes place. Um, in closing, where can people find your websites or social media, any links you want to share? And we'll, of course, put those in the show notes for people. Sure. Well, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, uh, Brian Alcorn, my operations director, is also on LinkedIn. 
And our website is www.biocybernaut.com. And it's easy because a biocybernaut is to inner space what an astronaut is to outer space. Not is a Greek suffix meaning somebody who goes on an adventure. <laughs> so it's the inner adventure. <laughs> Through the cybernetic technology. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. All right, man. Well, thanks so much. And uh, Thank gonna, you so much for being here. Yeah. And I, you know what? You've I'm, you set a new goal. I'm going to get myself back in and, and do that mm. theta training at some mm. point. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I love coming to Sedona mm. for any reason, but mm. to come here and be able to have such a transformative experience would be really cool. So, Well, I'd be thrilled if you moved here, you and your fiance. Well, you know, I gave it a shot this time. We'll we'll see how it goes. We're the we're still on the hunt, but you know, I have a feeling we're going to end up back here a lot more, if not all the time. Yeah. So thanks again, and we'll see you soon. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I want to remind you that ninety nine point nine percent of the episodes published by the Lifestylist podcast are also available on video. And if you happen to have watched this show on video, uh, you'll know why I'm taking a moment to promote that feature. Not only have I reinvested our uh, sponsorship funds into three great cameras, so I now have uh, most of the time at least, unless I'm doing it myself, three cameras and great editing. But this particular episode was recorded in a really funny location in the processing room at BioCyberNot. So I encourage you to not only go back perhaps and peep some of your favorite moments of this conversation with Jim uh, on video, but also keep in mind that the future episodes will be published the same way, audio and video. I'd also like to take a moment to invite you to follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Luke Story. And what you will find there is documentation of all things Lifestylist Podcast and everything else I'm sharing in the world of healing through spirituality and biohacking. I'll tell you a little secret too. If you want to watch these interviews live as they happen in real time, you definitely want to follow me on Insta because I live stream every interview I do in the moment in the real nitty gritty behind the scenes fashion that I love to do. So uh, follow me on Instagram at Luke Story. Now, a moment from our sponsors, uh, by Optimizers, man. These guys, of course, make the Magnesium Breakthrough, which is a product I'm a huge fan of. I've got some here with me uh, in my travel bag. I took one this morning, as a matter of fact, before I started the 12 hours of meditation I did with Joe Dispenza, <laughs> however long it was. It, it really was a lot. And uh, that Magnesium helped me to calm down and drop in. So if you want to check it out, go to buyoptimizers.com slash Luke. Use the code Luke, uh, Luke 10 and save 10% off any order. And we got Beekeepers Naturals. You can find them at beekeepersnaturals.com slash Luke Story. Code there is Lifestylist and you'll save 15% off. I've got my propolis spray here with me on the road. See, I practice what I preach. I don't like to, uh, you know, represent sponsors that I don't really use in my life. It's just a thing I have. I don't know. It's integrity feels good to me. And uh, I guess that's why I do it and not... You know, these companies send me some free stuff. I'm going to use it too. You know what I'm saying? Now, what I don't have with me on this trip, but I wish I did, is our third and final sponsor, and that is Cacao Bliss by Mindful Health. You can find that at earthechofoods.com slash Luke Story. That's earthechofoods.com slash Luke Story. What you're looking for there is the Cacao Bliss. It's an amazing superfood cacao powdered elixir drink. And if you want to save 15% off of your Cacao Bliss, use the code LUKE15. All right, you guys, that's it for this episode, man. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Again, share it with a friend. It's, it's highly appreciated when you guys take the time to share this. You know, if you don't want to buy the, the wares of our sponsors, so be it. That's totally fair and understandable. Uh, but I want you to know that it is immensely supportive when you share this episode with friends and family. And uh, I'll be back at you next week with a really interesting conversation I had in Austin, Texas with Aubrey Marcus, where we really unpack a uh, Bufo Alvarius toad ceremony. And that is one you definitely don't want to miss. See you then. 